really. The purpose of this is to simply have a unique conversation about living with an illness. <clears throat> what we want to do, and I want to do, is obliterate any shame from having an illness. Um, I want to obliterate the shame of a debilitating illness. And so share, sharing my story is going to help me heal spiritually and emotionally. And then I'm going to put you guys to work. For instance, disabling illness, what ideas or practices and beliefs would support you? Come up with three ideas as a group. And we're going to have you put them in chat, as well as books you might recommend. And then after this session, I'm going to combine all of the information we've gotten. And I will, I will feed it back to everybody once it's been edited and so forth. In addition, you know, add ideas on, on dealing and relating to a loved one with a debilitating illness. So that's, uh, that's the objective of the, of the breakout sessions and listen with that intent. So I've gone ahead and drafted the guidelines that were developed from the breakout sessions. So first of all, educate yourself, do your research. As soon as you get the diagnosis, even though you might be afraid of what you find, look at multiple credible sources of information. Now, I delayed that just because of fear, and it would have been better if I got right to it. Learn the side effects of medications and supplements. Uh, how are, you know, the mental attitude is so important. Find answers to the question, what can I do to live the most robust, fulfilling life possible despite my illness. Focus on what you can do, not what you can't do. So don't accept the new normal, which is a term I'm not a real fan of, too readily. Look for self-limiting beliefs. So dealing with medical professionals, <clears throat> be constructive and friendly with everybody you meet. It's really important uh, in dealing with with everybody who services you in a medical situation. Uh, you can ask favors of people when you're particularly friendly with them. If you complain all the time and bitch and moan and uh, so forth, uh, they're not going to be quite as conducive to helping you. Don't be passive and compliant if there's an issue. Be assertive about what you want. Don't worry about hurting feelings. If you're denied a request, if it's important, ask them to document their refusal or go to the next higher level. Uh, they might have a tendency to rethink their den denial. Explore getting a second opinion. Doctors don't mind second opinions. It just affirms that they know what they're doing. Follow your doctor's orders. There's, if there's a conflict between doctors, what they're telling you, get it sorted out. If you have multiple doctors, make sure they're communicating with each other and have access to all of your medical records. <clears throat> And of course, take the prescribed medications properly. And then it's very important to seek out community. Don't isolate yourself. Expand your support network. Reach out to friends in social media. Join groups. Don't let your, your illness, your health, be shame-based. It's not shame-based. Build community with, with those who are experiencing the same disease and seek out stories and opinions. And very important to identify advocates. It's important that you have at least one person who's looking out for you. They don't need to care for you, but they should be willing to look out for you. Be with you on important doctor's appointments and be an advocate while you're in the hospital. And of course, it's very helpful to explore uh, uh, giving someone a power of attorney. So that's it. So let's go ahead and move on to my story. Have you ever walked into a clinic and zip past a person walking slowly or using a walker. I'm sure you've all had that experience. So do you really see them? Or do you feel kind of a self-satisfaction that you are not them? Uh, do you have a sense of gratitude that you're not them? So I've had those same thoughts, uh, you know, in past years and even now at some level, but I now know that each person you see are living lives courageously. So I'm going to spend the next, I'm going to spend the next half an hour plus, uh, take notes and uh, um, talking about 
the, the journey that I've been on for the last six years now. And um, <clears throat> I'll have some uh, PowerPoint uh, stuff to share, but most of it is going to be just my talking. So, so I'm going to begin in 2000 uh, when I was 58. Uh, I had mitral valve surgery uh, at St. Luke's. I was in the hospital for 18 days, had complications. In the midst of it, I had AFib, which is where your atrial fibrillation, where your heart flutters when you have arrhythmia. Um, AFib can be uh, very debilitating, or you can live with it without too much of a problem. Uh, it's not generally fatal unless you have a stroke, but it's good not to be in re AFib. It's, it's amazing. So um, Dr. Lozano, who was my cardiologist, who became my cardiologist, came in and, um, and did, an, uh, did a uh, uh, shock procedure and put me into sinus rhythm. So in 2010, I had the atrial fibrillation come up again, and Lozano put me on amiodarone, which is an anti, anti uh, medication that worked very, very well. Um, and, you know, during this period of time from 2000 uh, up until really 2015, uh, I'd been working as an executive coach, moving around town, meeting with clients, having them come to my office. I've been fully engaged in my coaching practice, as well as doing a lot of traveling. Um, in the spring of 2015, I went to uh, my pulmonologist at the time, and for a kind of a study of looking at my sleep apnea results. And we went over that and he said, by the way, I've looked at your x-ray. It was taken about a year ago and it looks kind of squirrely. Um, we, I think we ought to do a pulmonary function test with you. And so we did that that day, that afternoon. And that's where you go in a booth and they take a lot of readings of your breathing. I came back and met with him and he said, you know, he says, it's likely that you have pulmonary fibrosis. And uh, what we need to do is do a CAT scan on you. you you've got, there's a good chance you have pulmonary fibrosis. And, and basically you have two to five years to live. And that it's progressive. Um, and that some patients die within two months. I mean, they'll get a cold or they get bronchitis, go into pneumonia and they're, and they're dead. So uh, you know, it's, it's highly variable. Um, and you can imagine uh, my, what my reaction to that was. I'm, I'm walking out of the, uh, <clears throat> of the office just totally gobsmacked, uh, wondering what the hell, you know, I feel fine. I'm not, there's nothing wrong with me. I, you know, maybe I'm out of shape, but uh, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not about to drop dead. Uh, but, you know, I went to the internet and looked up pulmonary fibrosis, and it says <clears throat> pulmonary fibrosis is a rare condition in which lungs become scarred over time. There's no cure. Life expectancy is less than five years. And, um, <clears throat> and so uh, I, uh, you know, was just my anxiety went through the roof. I mean, you know, existential anxiety, lots of questions about what to do, when and how to tell Judith, how to tell Barry. You know, how to tell my sister and my other family and friends, you know, what, how, do, how do you handle this? <clears throat> so I'm anxiety prone. <clears throat> and I want to give you the kind of the ongoing thing that's been going on with me over this period of time. You know, and being anxiety prone, of course, what better way to induce anxiety than tell people you're gonna die, tell somebody you're gonna die, you know? So <clears throat> I've had this dance now for, between anxiety and shortness of breath for the last multiple years. Uh, the anxiety causes shortness of breath, the fibrosis is progressing, it must be advancing, you know, those kind of things. It's kind of like having a tornado coming at me from a distance and I'm scared out of my wits and it's relentless. And I'm expecting it to hit me at any time. Although winds seem to be ever getting so slightly stronger and stronger, 
it's not, you know, it doesn't hit me. Uh, but the winds are stronger as evidenced by my breath and fatigue. Listen, <clears throat> I let it sit for a couple of days <clears throat> and I decided to go to, uh, uh, go, go to see Jerry Rule. Jerry Rule is a therapist. Some of you know him, he did the fall gathering. And in talking with Jerry, he said, look, you gotta tell Judith, you can't infantilize her. She's an adult, she's a big girl, she can handle it. And so I got in my mind, okay, I'm gonna get a little more data and then I'll be able to tell her. Uh, I then called a friend, a guy named Lou Greenberg, who's a physician, he's an internist, we had lunch. <clears throat> and he said, look, he said, pulmonary fibrosis, yeah, you know, you're gonna probably die of something else. And uh, because, and uh, <clears throat> the one thing Lou Greenberg said was, look, the one thing you don't want to do is get a lung biopsy. Lung biopsies, they might want to do it, but they're going to cause real per trouble. So it's more than diagnostic, it exacerbates things. Don't have a lung biopsy. So I then told Judith, uh, we were headed to Barcelona and uh, Judith was fabulous and she has been through this entire time, she has been 100% there, 100% supportive. And I have confidence that she will be there. Uh, that's the, the saving grace that uh, is always with me. Uh, there's always uncertainty, but, but that's given me a lot of comfort. And we continue to travel uh, to Vermont and New York and elsewhere all the way through 2018. Exercised a lot, the swimming, the light racquetball, at the end of 2015, I went to a 10-day Vipassana retreat to get grounded spiritually and, uh, you know, at, at least attempting to. And I started noticing changes in my lung capacity. And, uh, uh, and, and you know, to hear the question of, of, of uh, is it, um, you know, is it fibrosis or is it anxiety? I go to the, and have a pulmonary function test with a new pulmonologist. I went to a new one. I want to get rid of this guy. He was too squirrely. And, and uh, uh, just the way he told me was just egregious. And most doctors communicate that way that I've, I've heard with this disease. Um, and so I went to a guy and he said, look, we need to do a lung biopsy. Well, he was history. Okay. <laughs> and so, so I went to another one guy named Farjo, who uh, I've stayed with since, he did a PF test and he said, oh, he said, you need to get off the, the amiodarone. And I said, what? And he said, yeah, there's, a, there's an association with amiodarone and pulmonary fibrosis. Okay, well, the other guy didn't tell me that, you know? So I go to Lozano, and, who is the cardiologist, and he says, look, he says, I've been doing this 20 years, Amiodarone is not an issue. Uh, you need to continue to take it to stop, you know, not have the AFib. And so I decided to stay on it. But I wrote a letter to Lou Greenberg, uh, the physician, and I said, look, hey, Lou, I've got dueling specialists here. Uh, can you help me out? And he looked, he did some research, came back and said, uh, amiodarone is not the cause of the pulmonary fibrosis. So I stayed on it. And um, and then later on that year, I went into Fargo again, had another PF test, some change, but not major, but I did a six minute walk test. And Fargo said, look, you're going downhill. You need to start taking an antipribotic medication called Espria. And, um, and then that afternoon he called me and he said, the other thing I forgot to mention, you need to get off the amiodarone. So, so I go to, I go to, um, uh, Lozano, and um, we get off the meds. And the conversation with Lozano was interesting because he said, look, you've got mild PF. I was talking about not living until the next election. This was in November of 2016. And he says, no, he says, you're going to, it's highly likely that you're going to live to the next election. And um, so as you can see, there's all kinds of mixed messages around, around longevity with this with this disease. Um, but in 2016, um, you know, I, I was not able to walk briskly and not be out of uh, briskly, not be out of breath. I went to Portland 
uh, and then went into the Canadian Rockies that summer, was at 6,000 feet. Um, the portable oxygen generator helped, but boy, I realized I'm not coming back to the mountains. This is too challenging. This is too difficult. And um, <clears throat> so I realized I needed to celebrate what I had done. And then let go of it. So I'm going to read my diary to you <clears throat> at that point. I have enjoyed the mountains all my life and have climbed many in my youth. I now know that I have to give up the mountains. When I finish this trip, I will declare that I'm letting go of being in the mountains for the rest of my life. And I celebrate having an opportunity to be at Lake Tahoe and the Sarias. Uh, Sierra's um, Desolation Valley, the Rockies, uh, the Alps, Canadian Rockies, Denver, Sedona, Costa Rica, Haleakala, Machu Picchu in Peru, Chile, Alaska. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, that was that's one of the things that I'm doing is I'm celebrating having been able to do things when I can no longer do them and letting them go. Um, high, a couple of high notes uh, on the, in the fall. <coughs> I'm still exercising and swimming. I'm continuing to robustly pursue my coaching practice, but I still feel this, this change. And one of the things I did, <coughs> which um, I found to be really, quite helpful. I want to share my screen with you and, and, and tell you about one thing I've done that I, I did that was I found very helpful. I went through the, the presence process, which is a I'm going to talk about a little bit later, but it, it's, it's a way of integrating your emotional response and to have a better way of living. And um, one, is, one of the things it says is let Let's intend to begin unraveling this per perpetual mayhem by forgiving our parents and blessing them with the unconditional love we wish we had from them as children. And so what I, what I did, it just came to me that I needed to do something around my parents. And so uh, I wrote their biography. I have family papers and the World War II generation, they have quite a story quite remarkable. And writing that was very, very important to, to, to begin to get context for my life, which is important to me, is to kind of get an understanding of what this is all about at some level for me. The other thing that happened in the fall of 2016 is, uh, is we had the fall gathering and uh, Oh, it was just really important for Barry to be there, and he was. He showed up, and he's been tremendous support for me during this during this whole time. <clears throat> so um, now it gets interesting. Um, you know, I, I can have the continued uh, anxiety in 2017, and the tornado is still coming, but I'm really getting depleted, uh, limited functionality. I've had to give up the PEP board member of the prison entrepreneurial program because going to the prison was so exhausting. And I started having episodes of atrial fibrillation. And one time in the emergency room, I'm, I'm, I have AFib and they're giving me medication and and the physician there said, oh, yeah, she said, amiodarone, yeah, pulmonary fibrosis. We knew about that. Well, it seemed to be common knowledge, uh, you know, that, that, that there was an association. But one thing that happened that I thought was funny and, and, and sort of weird is I went to a psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist, I wanted to find out about anti-anxiety medication. So I I'll go to this, this person. And... Um, I tell them my family history and uh, 
I told him my father died when he was 54 and his father died when he was 54. And their response was, well, I guess you're living on borrowed time. So <laughs> I walk out of there and saying, well, that was helpful. <laughs> and, uh, and then I now know why Tom Cruise is, is, uh, doesn't like psychiatrists. So, um, but I mean, you know, in, in 18, uh, I, I went to Lozano, we decided to do the, the ablation procedure. And uh, an ablation procedure is where they, they shock your heart and they deaden nerves in your heart that trigger the atrial fib and they stop it. And so um, he referred me to one of the top cardiology firms in Houston, Paul and Garcia. I meet with a cardiologist, the surgeon, and I check his credentials and reviews. They're all very good. And in, on April 26th of 2018, I go ahead and do the ablation procedure. And the ablation procedure was to increase the quality of my life because at that point I was pretty much uh, knocked out of commission, um, you know, quite a bit and things seemed to go well, but by the time I got home, uh, I was in great discomfort, unable to breathe. Uh, I went on oxygen 24 seven for the next two and a half months. I went through medical chaos to try to figure out what happened. Uh, while everybody was well-intentioned, it was tough. And just some of the things that happened, you know, I had a PF test, CAT scan, a bronchoscopy. Uh, the doctor came in to Judith after they examined my lungs and said it was very pessimistic. I had a catheterization procedure to determine whether I had pulmonary hypertension. Uh, I was misdiagnosed uh, with a, the wrong number in the cath procedure. And I had three unnecessary meetings with a pulmonary hypertension specialist, took drugs unnecessarily uh, with high side effects. Um, I had conversations with surgeons in Houston, Cleveland, Ohio, and New Jersey to discuss interventions. And I wrote a scathing letter to the cardiologist who did the ablation procedure with a copy to the chairman of the Department of Cardiology at Baylor University in order to get him to pick up the phone and talk to me after four weeks. So it was like a two and a half month tsunami of uncertainty. And uh, I was finally determined, it was finally determined that during the ablation procedure, they fried my phrenic nerve, which controls my right diaphragm, and that my right lung was paralyzed. And this was on top of the pulmonary fibrosis. So by midsummer of 2018, I'm stuck with massive fatigue. Uh, when I wake up each morning, I feel like I've been hit by a Mack truck and I'm on oxygen 24 seven, and I've had to give up my coaching practice. I'm so wiped out and, uh, and, and hauling the oxygen around was a bit of a challenge. And I can't even go out to dinner with friends for lunch. I have, you know, I have no idea whether I'll live four months or five years. And I know if I get a cold, it might go into bronchitis and pneumonia and do me in. So the question is then, uh, how do I restructure my life? And I thought of others in my past and even currently who are my heroes. And um, I gotta warn you, this is, this is the place where I cry, cry a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so the first one is my dad. He practiced medicine as a cardiologist, interestingly enough, in a wheelchair as a sole practitioner for six years until his life ended when he was 54. And um, he was in great pain, had three kids supporting him, supporting three kids. And he just, you know, lived as best he could full out during that period of time. And um, he was just, uh, I didn't realize how much of a challenge he had until I read the letters when I did the biography. My twin brother, Gordon, um, he had cerebral palsy, he had epilepsy, he was limited in intelligence, lived a normal life, had, was married, couldn't drive, but at any point in time, he could drop with a seizure in the middle of traffic. 
you know, when he's crossing the street while he's on a bus. And he just was relentless in being able to live a full life. Uh, some of these guys, some of the, you guys know Peter Kant Haskell. Uh, he had Parkinson's for 25 years. And he, again, was heroic. Tom and I used to talk, and Joe, uh, we talked, we met with Peter regularly. Uh, we we're all good friends. And, uh, and Peter was just incredible in the way that he managed his illness and led life. And then, of course, many of you know Al Levy, who died last year. And uh, he had cardiovascular disease and um, uh, 12 stints, uh, traveled, open heart surgery, continued to travel, lived a, lived a full life. And so, um, so the question is, you know, what do I do? And, you know, one of the things I did I, I realized that I needed to have social interaction. Uh, and I also know that um, people are not gonna be calling me every day. You know, they, they just don't. I mean, regardless of how good a friend you are, you don't call everybody every day. And, um, and so I needed to reach out. And so I started inviting, and you guys have been, you know, I'm, not, I'm gonna name some of you as we go through this, uh, maybe checking out, but. You guys have been absolutely fantastic to, you know, to, to come to my house and meet with me uh, for lunch uh, on Zoom meetings after we got hit by COVID. Um, each one of you here, you've been on the Saturday morning men's cafe. So I've had a relationship with every one of you at some level or another. And that has been absolutely staggeringly important to me. And I'm very... <laughs> I'm very grateful. So, um, the other thing I started to do, you know, how do you spend your time? I mean, are you going to watch daytime TV all the time? I can't work in the yard. You know, I can't do normal chores the way I used to. Um, what do you do? You know, and well, I, I'm a head guy. And so, I decided to start writing a blog and I ended up coming up with, uh, you know, writing this blog and I wrote it, I wrote it for me. Uh, but you know, a number of people read the blog and, but I got a huge amount of benefit for, from it because it gave, you know, I, I codified my belief system, what's important to me. Um, it gave me a context for my life. I mean, even put myself in the, in the midst of all of history and all of the whole universe. I mean, that's talking about thinking big, right? And, um, and so you can see a number of subject areas that I covered that were, that were very meaningful to me. And uh, <clears throat> I've referred back in my mind to those kind of, that, that kind of thinking that kind of got solidified a lot over the last several years. I want to share with you just one uh, uh, summary from that. Uh, I did a summary uh, of the first 12 blogs, and I led the summary with um, this. And it's a, <clears throat> it's a short video of Judith and I sailing in a, in a, a yacht on, you know, a 32 foot hunter on uh, Galveston Bay. <clears throat> This video represents a simple present moment. The love and connection between Judith and me, our connection to nature, to the flow of life, the wind, the water, the sailing technology of a thousand years in the making. We come together through our permutations of our respective lives and the lives of our ancestors and the history of the universe. It's a testament to our lived lives that are qualitatively and materially better than most humans. And with these blessings, we are brought together in a simple, sublime moment. And the present moment is superior to and transcends all speculation. And so um, that video was taken before I had these issues, obviously. Um, 
so you think about the spiritual dynamics of this. What you know, what do you do spiritually, you know, in, in order to get centered? And for me, um, the spiritual work really consisted of, 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 of meditation and breathing techniques. Uh, the presence process, which I'm going through again now, is a 10-week course with daily practices, uh, which is uh, basically the practices around breathing. Um, I went through Sam, uh, Sam Harris's The Waking Up course. Uh, Barry is doing that now, and uh, he's, he's, he tells me that he's getting great benefit from that. Uh, there's an on week online course uh, of John Cabot Zen of medically based stress reduction, which is very good. And I share the breathing techniques, uh, the chime, the five chimes on a, on a men's cafe one time. And of course, there are lots of books on dying and, and, and living end of life and all that stuff. Uh, grace in dying has been very, very challenging. Trust me, it is challenging when you read it. Uh, because it's, it hits you right in the face. Uh, but it's a very, 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 very good book. Um, so um, here I'm doing these press works. I'm, you know, I've, I've got friends coming over um, and I'm writing my blog. I'm, you know, I'm engaged in things, I'm doing things. And, but the one thing I realized was that I didn't know anybody with pulmonary fibrosis. Here I had this thing for three years and I'd been kind of in denial about it, you know, throughout that time. And I thought I need to, I need to learn more about this. And so um, I started going to, to uh, webinars and learning about online resources. And um, uh, the, 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 uh, this is a listing of all of the resources out around pulmonary fibrosis. I'm not going to tell you all about them because you're not going to get pulmonary fibrosis. I mean, we've got a couple of people on the call who have it, but it's, it's a very, very rare disease. But when you take, you know, 80,000 people in the United States have it, you know, they can create communities on, on uh, Facebook and there's a foundation and all of this. I did find that the uh, wellness programs, the, the, the physical uh, pulmonary rehab programs be very, very helpful. And I have a personal wellness uh, specialist that I meet with twice a week who kicks my ass. Uh, that's, that's, he's been a lifesaver to me, a guy named David Younger. And, uh, but I realized that um, we have all these resources, but they're all educational. They're, they don't really create a, a vehicle for people to have intimate conversations <clears throat> about what's going on with them and exchange ideas because there's a lot of complication to this around medications, around oxygen uses and so forth. <clears throat> and so I decided to stop, uh, to, uh, <clears throat> I'm telling myself to stop, share. I'm not sure why. Oh, I wanted to share something with you before we go on. In November, I mean, in, in, in 2019, uh, Judith decided to, uh, you know, go to Vermont and, and Massachusetts, who was Vermont to the family reunion. Barry and the girls were going to be there, three granddaughters and Barry and his wife. And uh, I just couldn't go. I was, I was just so wiped out. I wasn't able to go. And I, I chose not to. I did a lot of research on it. We Zoomed when they were there. I, at, that, at this point, don't regret having not gone. Uh, even then, I wasn't, you know, I just did not feel well enough to be able to travel and, and be there. Um, and so I'm going to go back to um, the slides and show you um, what I created for having these support groups. It's called Pulmonary Success Circles. And what I did was create a website that uh, was all about people with pulmonary fibrosis, had videos and invited them through Facebook. I invited them to the website and asked them to contact me. And I created Pulmonary Success Circles. So we now have three of them going 
And uh, two of them I'm facilitating. One I'm not, I've, I've gotten a facilitator. I want to get facilitator for the third one that's just starting. And these have been wonderful. These, these people are, you know, they're just you and me. I mean, they're ordinary folks, but we have our shared humanity and we're able to, on a weekly call, support each other. And this is an example of, of uh, the pulmonary success group. Um, you see everybody smiling. We're having a good time at the same time of dealing with, with this, uh, this illness. And um, I've just found it to be extremely helpful. Um, and, it, you know, it's been a way of, of be me, my being able to make a, make a contribution. So I'm, I've got a couple more things and I'm going to finish. Uh, I want to read a diary entries to you. Um, this was in June 21st of 2021. <clears throat> Mike Tyson, Tyson died this morning. He's the third person to die who's died in the pulmonary success circles in the last 18 months since I started it. I've been thinking about my health situation and how things have evolved. For it not for the ablation procedure or accident three years ago, I would be, have been leading a fairly normal life. Probably would have wound down the coaching practice, still faced COVID issues. I would have been feeling a lot better and and, uh, you know, I may have been on oxygen, maybe not. Um, but that being said, to reframe it, this time has given me an opportunity to really reflect on my life, to write the blog, I've solidified my understanding of my belief system, have a context for my life. I've been working on legacy stuff, such as movies and diaries and an organization of family papers. I've created the pulmonary success circles and I continue to have the men's cafe which is very rewarding and do pro bono coaching. I continue to have men and women in my life who I love. And, and uh, while I've not been you know, vital um, and I've had to deal with all this stuff associated with this disease, I have not suffered. I've reframed this these three years as positive and meaningful for me. So Tom Hoke's death, as well as Mike's death, has led me to understand that even though there's an ordeal and, and there is suffering and dying, dire, uh, dying it, it is not that bad. Uh, it can be okay. You know, the, the drugs that you take are very, very uh, helpful. And, and of course, deep down inside, I, you know, I want to continue to live. But I'm 80 years old in February and I've had a wonderful life with no regrets. And uh, of course, many joys and some sorrows, including my son Brian's death. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking at it and I'm a seven on the Enneagram. I look at positive stuff. I'm looking at it positively in the sense that I am fully leading a meaningful life. <clears throat> now, you recall 2019, when I couldn't go to Vermont. Well, here they're going to Vermont again this summer. And in May or April, I'm telling on the Polar Success Circle, I'm bemoaning the fact that I'm not gonna be able to go to Vermont. And <clears throat> Nancy uh, on the call says, she's, she's headed to a double lung transplant. Uh, she says to me, well, why not? Why aren't you going? And it sort of like struck me, you know, well, gosh, you know, maybe I could go. And I realized that that was really a self-limiting belief that, that I could go if I really orchestrated it right. And I went. <laughs> 